Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. And I ask all attendees who are not recognized to speak to please mute their connection until such time as they are recognized by the chair. <clears throat> I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, Roger DuPont. Oh, Roger is waving. Uh, Patrick Hanlon. Pat, can you hear me? Pat, you're on mute too. Oh, 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 I see what happened. All right, hold on. Where is this setting? Uh, Colleen, I don't know if you remember where this is, the ability to let people unmute themselves. So that's on, it just, it's not checked. Let's see, allow, okay. allow participants to unmute themselves. So everybody should be able to. Okay. There we go. Oh, perfect. All right, thank you, Colleen. Roger, good to see you. Pat Hanlon? I'm here. Good to see you. Dan Riccadelli? Here. Have you with us. Uh, Venkat Holly will be joining us um, around eight o'clock. And then Elaine Hoffman? Here. Elaine, good to have you with us. Um, here on behalf of the town, uh, we have the board's zoning assistant, Colleen Ralston. Here. Good to have you with us. And I don't think there's anyone else specifically from the town. Um, the consultants for the board, we have uh, Paul Haverty, our technical review consultant. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Uh, we have Sean Reardon from Tetra Tech. Good evening. Good evening. And we have Cliff Bomer from Davis Square Architects. Hello, everybody. Good evening. And then appearing on behalf of the applicant, we have Paul Feldman. Hello. Good evening, Paul. And Matthew Majuri from the Majuri Companies. To you. Um, good evening, person. And good everybody. evening. And then um, I'll have you introduce your team um, in a sure. little bit, but you believe everyone is here, correct? I do. Sh shall I do that now? No, I'll get to it in a sec. Okay. Okay. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act relative to extending certain state of emergency accommodations signed into law on July 16th, 2022. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2023 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded, so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on this meeting's agenda or on the town's website, unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as the chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. <clears throat> so turning to item two on our agenda this evening, which is the public, the continuation of the public hearing for the residences at Mill Brook, located at 1021, 1025 Massachusetts Avenue. So this evening, the board is continuing the comprehensive permit hearing for the residences at Mill Brook, the redevelopment of an existing site in the neighborhood office district. 
The submitted documents are available from the board's website or as an attachment to the posted agenda. At the January hearings, the board heard testimony regarding wetland and stormwater plans for the property, traffic and transportation issues, and architectural considerations. At the last hearing, we discussed the landscape plans and revisions to the civil plans for the property. Tonight, we plan to discuss plans for the construction phase of the project, revised comments from the board's engineering consultant, and other revisions presented by the applicant. After the members have had an opportunity to ask their questions of the applicant, the hearing will be open for public comment and questions on the topics discussed this evening. The board has scheduled several hearings for this project, and the scheduled dates are available on the project website under the ZBA page on the town website. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will discuss the plans for the next session with the applicant before a vote to continue this hearing and adjourn for the evening. So, um, admit people from the waiting room. And then at this point, I'd like to introduce attorney Paul Feldman from Davis Mall with the Augustine to introduce tonight's presenters. Uh, good evening, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the zoning board. My name is Paul Feldman. I'm an attorney representing the applicant. Um, Matthew Maggiore uh, from the Maggiore Companies um, is with us along with Paul Maggiore and Jackie Maggiore. Um, and we have our uh, civil engineer on the project, Michael Novak. We have the architect on the project, Chris Mohorn. Um, and we also have um, from Van Essen Associates, our um, construction management plan expert. Um, as a brief introduction, and just to remind uh, the board and the public uh, where we are in the process, when we last met two weeks ago, uh, we presented in detail the landscape plan for the project. Uh, we also presented um, civil um, um, revisions that were made in response to some of the uh, third party review comp uh, comments from Tetra Tech. And we presented to the board a series of um, revisions, both to the um, size of the building, the setbacks, uh, the front setback, the side setbacks, and some changes to the um, internal architecture and external architecture to respond to comments that we have been hearing from the zoning board and from the public. Um, we also uh, had a full presentation from by Matt Maggiore with regard to how the building will be constructed on site, uh, the phases of construction and uh, the, um, uh, the techniques that will be used to make sure that the building can be built um, um, on the site um, properly and safely. Um, I mentioned um, at the meeting two weeks ago that we were specifically deferring until tonight a presentation of the delivery of construction materials, which would require um, access to the site from Massachusetts Avenue, from the front of the property. Um, and we will be presenting that this evening. Um, 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 Dan DeRoche from Vanessa Associates, um, our traffic consultant, you may remember Jeff Dirk, presented the uh, traffic impact analysis. Dan specializes in construction management plans and will be presenting on, on that particular topic. Um, we also want to present um, uh, some revisions that were made to the civil drawings and to um, particularly the front plaza uh, of the project as a result of um, making the building two feet narrower and setting the building back um, three feet, 3.6 uh, feet. So we'll present those as well. Um, as my final um, introductory comments, um, as the members of the applicant team have been going through our checklists and thinking about where we are in the public hearing process, um, we believe that by the uh, end of the public hearing tonight, um, we will have presented um, through our experts and from the applicant, um, the, the applicants themselves, um, the full scope of the project um, and the permit that uh, we've requested. Um, and uh, we, uh, unless there are some open, specific open questions, um, we feel like after the last four or five public hearings, whatever it's been, 
Um, we are uh, getting to the point where uh, hopefully the board has all the information it needs to be able to evaluate the applicant's request for a comprehensive permit and, and render a decision. Uh, so with that, we, we figured the, the best way to proceed tonight was to start off with the um, um, construction um, um, access from Massachusetts Avenue for the delivery of materials. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Dan DeRoach from Vanass and Associates uh, to present um, that program to the zoning board. Dan? Dan, we can't hear you. Up. Yeah, not yet, Dan. Your microphone's not working. It happens to all of us, though. Don't worry. <laughs> At least once, anyway. It looks like he's reconnecting. Yep. Now, if you unmute Dan. Now, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Fantastic. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks, Paul. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman and board members uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I have a set of plans that I believe was shared with everybody yesterday. Um, Matt and, and Paul, I think, sent it over. Um, I, I can share my screen, I hope, and walk yes, through that if that's, does that work for everybody? Please. Let's see here. Uh, where are we? Let me know if you can see you can't see this window. I'm, I'm a Teams user, not a Zoom user. So uh, <laughs> um, I am on you go share, down the bottom, screen. Yep. share screen. And then you click yep. on, you click, you'll, you'll see all the, the um, all the- There it is, there it all, is. There you go. Yep, no, I got it. The thing was grayed out. Now you should be able to see the construction management plan. Perfect. Okay. so. Uh, what we've put together here is, uh, um, you know, a, a graphic showing how the site is going to be occupied, the buildings, uh, the areas involved with the building construction, and what's happening out in the uh, roadway uh, directly in front of the site. So, um, and just to give you a little background, I've I've been with Vanessa and Associates for 25 or six years now. Um, doing design work um, and worked my way into the construction field um, dealing with construction management plans traffic management plans uh, for roadway work and um, you know handle most of the field work um, that our company's involved in you know for active construction projects so um, this is uh, what I like to be doing you know versus being in the office uh, working on the computer all the time uh, so Cover page, uh, some general notes here. Uh, not gonna go through all these, but these are just a, a bunch of uh, general notes about specific topics and what will or won't be done um, by the contractor throughout this process. Um, you know, if anyone, you know, of the board had looked at a comment, had questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have on these. Um, then we had a uh, estimated schedule um showing 
you know, the different phases of construction. And this project is expected to take um, approximately a year to a year and a half to finish. Um, uh, just a, a typical detail of a wheelchair ramp that we're going to have to build to accommodate pedestrians, which I'll explain in a minute. And, you know, a summary of all the signs and sizes and what have you, which are called out on the following plans. So we have this broken out into four phases. Uh, phase one, which you're looking at here, shows the site right in the middle here. Um, 1021, 1025, uh, Massachusetts Ave, I believe it is. And this is kind of like the site enabling phase, we call it, where contractors moving in, uh, they're establishing the, you know, the limits of the site. We have construction fencing you know, around the perimeter. There's some erosion control measures out in the back, a detention area to be built. Um, and out on the street area, we have, um, you know, the, the, the site uh, enclosure fence will encompass the sidewalk area and the parking lane directly in front of the site. Now, obviously with the sidewalk area closed, we have to accommodate the pedestrian movements um, on the north side of the road. So we are proposing uh, a temporary crosswalk be installed um, to the, just in front of the property to the west, I'm sorry, to the east of the site with you know, wheelchair ramps on both sides of the road, warning signs on both sides of the road. Um, and then the pedestrians walking down the north side of the road would you know, cross um, to the south side, continue down to the signalized intersection where there's a existing crosswalk and they can get back over to the north side of the road. Um, so that there is access to every um, property along Massachusetts Ave uh, via the sidewalk, not including the site. Um, so the fence, you know, will run down across the sidewalk so people can't walk into the active uh, work zone. So uh, in addition, during this phase, you know, the, the, uh, the demolition of the existing buildings would occur and setting up other, um, you know, preparations for the, you know, forthcoming construction, you know, with the, uh, like a stonewash area for vehicles exiting, you know, the site will be a gravel condition at a period of time and we wanna prevent tracking of the material out onto the roadway. Um, the sidewalk area is going to be removed within the fence and there'll be uh, trash receptacles and uh, portable toilets, you know, uh, you know, brought to the site. So the site is basically sufficient with, you know, its own needs. So that's phase one, pretty basic. Then moving on, phase two is the beginning of the construction of the, um, the lower level parking area. So there'll be excavation happening and uh, the installation of the foundation walls and the slab. Um, the setup out on the roadway has not changed from what was, you know, what was set up in phase one. So everything there um, is the same. And what we're setting up here is, you know, fencing across the front that, um, as I said, blocks the parking lane. Uh, the bike lane and the travel lane for vehicles remains open at all times. And there's an entry gate and an exit gate um, on, you know, the, the east and the west side of the of the site, you know, which is to accommodate the construction vehicle, worker vehicles, construction vehicles uh, coming in to do work or to deliver materials, uh, entering in and exiting out um, in a kind of right in, right out uh, scenario. Um, so foundation pad built uh, and staging area is out in the back and loading areas or offloading areas are out in the front. Um, there's a number of notes on here that call out specific items. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention, uh, there, is, there are existing bus stops on both sides of the road. The south side of the road is unimpacted by anything um, that's proposed on site. And on the northbound side, the bus, um, the limits of the bus stop are, you know, encroach across the front of the 
site by 20 feet, 25 feet, something like that. And the orientation of the fencing and the gates is being placed in such a way so that the buses coming in from the east will be able to drive in the travel lane like they normally would then pull over into the bus stop, stop, you know, at the, um, the signed location and then be able to pull out as they normally do. So there's no need to relocate um, the buses or the bus location. Uh, there's one sign on a utility pole that um, designates the bus area. And there's a note on the plan. Uh, it was on the previous page, but there's a note on the plan to just adjust the height of the sign so that it can be seen over the uh, fencing that's installed, which if I remember correctly is six foot tall. So it's possible that the, the sign where it is today might be fine, but if it's not, we wanna make sure that it's visible by you know the people driving by. Um, so that's phase two. Phase three is broken into two parts. Um, the initial part is to construct the uh, steel frame of the parking area, of the lower parking area and the slab above. And there's a crane that will be placed in the middle of the site to facilitate that installation. Uh, again, the activity in the roadway is unchanged. Uh, same setup, you know, pedestrian detour and everything. Phase two, or phase 3B, the second part of phase three, um, completes the installation of the steel and the slab erection on the front half. And then this same phase continues with the construction of the, you know, the timber framing from the slab, you know, upwards, um, you know, throughout the entire footprint. And then <clears throat> the final phase is the um, restoration of the sidewalk and parking area, you know, for, you know, the curb, it's likely that some of the curb will be removed, you know, to allow access for the construction vehicles during the process. So that will be restored. The original curb cuts that were there for the previous residential buildings will be removed and the new driveway entrance, which is shown right here, slightly to the uh, west side of the site um, will be installed as well. And then as part of this process, once this is completed, the, um, you know, the, the fencing around the site and the barrels. Um, in this case, we have barrels in the front instead of the fence because we're actually working. So we have to you know, get the fence out of the way. And then, you know, once that's completed, the uh, temporary sidewalk bypass um, cro our crosswalk right here will be removed. The two wheelchair ramps that were constructed will be returned to a um, sidewalk condition instead of a wheelchair ramp. And then um, the uh, sidewalk in front of the site will be open um, to, pub to the public use. So that is the basic outline of the process um, of the construction. And I don't know if there's any questions. Hey, thank you very much. Um, I do have a, a first question. So the proposed crosswalk, um, to the east of the site, what is in what is in the area where the the ramps are being proposed currently? Um, it, it's difficult to tell. It looks like part of the ramp on the north side of the street may, in fact, intersect with the driveway for the residents that's there. Or I believe the intent. Well, I know the intent is to start at the driveway um, that's on the west side of that residence and build to the to the west. Okay. Um, we originally we were going to try to tuck it right next to the site, but across the street, um, across the street from that, if we had a you know a perpendicular crossing, there's a driveway in between the two buildings that are opposite. So we slid it about ten feet to the east so that we can cross the street to where there's sidewalk on both sides. Okay. And is there any impact on the uh, bicycle lane? Uh, no, um, you know, other than vehicles entering and exiting the site like they would from any other driveway along the street, there's there's no direct impact to the um, to the bike lane or the or the travel lanes, you know, for the construction of the site work. 
And then is there the signage that is on the east side of the construction fence for pedestrians? Um, <clears throat> it, is the that arrow sign there, what is the proposed text for that sign? It's uh, you know, a standardized sign, you yep. know, it's got our nine dash nine designation from MUTCD, which is sidewalk closed and a you know left arrow crossing here. Okay. So um, would it be would it be possible to add um, some kind of notification that the uh, that the bus stop is still open and that uh, yes, that's actually a good point. Yeah, we could add like a small uh, like an orange sign that says um, you know access access to whatever the bus route number is i yeah. want to say it's 1061 if i remember correctly but whatever it is we could add that you know and just supplement this sign with a small placard just below it oh, that would be great yeah that's a good point that's a good point um Uh, those are the questions that I had immediately. Are there other questions from the board? Mr. Chair. Mr. Gadelli. Yeah, I had just jotted down a couple of questions. Um, um, I was just wondering, are you guys intent, uh, intending to do um, a generator for temporary power so you guys get the transformer out? I'd have to defer that to Matt. Um, th there is a possibility that we may be using, you know, smaller portable generators um, until we get a temporary electrical service um, to the property. Um, okay. But you no, know, nothing that would be running overnight. Uh, that would be a nuisance, you know, off hours. Right. Okay. I think to, you know, to whatever extent possible, um, you know, not locating those next to the residences on either side is is a benefit to the. To the neighbors absolutely and we would be sensitive to that and then uh mr chair one other question if i may yeah um so, so okay. um it, maybe this is uh less a construction question more of a, a civil or uh, maybe an ownership question but uh where the excavation is happening adjacent to the um the east and west neighbors uh is there any sort of you know, monitoring or um, but what's the plan to, to make sure that you're not disturbing the foundations of those those adjacent properties? So um, to the west is rather simple because that's a very shallow excavation. Um, you know, that's a, a standard, um, you know, uh, footing and frost wall. Um, so we'd have the ability to, to dig that on our property without any impact, you know, based on, um, you know, our setback uh, from the other property to the west um, because of the depth of our excavation for the basement construct uh, we will be uh, sheet piling um, which is basically what we call supportive excavation um, yeah. on the um, west you know along the frontage and wrapping around the corner beyond um, the as far as we need to go to get past um, the um, neighbor's that, property that's this area here i believe matt correct so that the, those would be sheet pile, which would be you know soldier piles and lagging, um, you know that would retain the the slope, and then we would you know basically dig to that um, from the interior footprint of the building. Okay, and that's that's the only piling uh, being planned for the site. So you won't be driving those for for days on end. It will just be no. Those are, those, are, those are H piles that are typically spaced about five feet apart, and then um, you know okay. there's um, lagging. You know there's um, basically mm -hmm. you know dunnage um you know that's that's driven in between the the h piles to you know to support the excavation as you go so that you're basically you know building a temporary retaining wall uh, okay. until you construct and you know backfill and bring back up anything further no thank you all right thank you um i could uh ask sean reardon if he has any comments I have a couple of quick questions. Um, num number one is so Matt or I don't know maybe Dan, what do you expect to be the the routes that your trucks are taking? The reason I ask is, you know, presumably trucks would come to the site and want to go back the way they came, but in this particular situation, probably not a good idea. 
um, because they really don't have any convenient place to turn around. Do you guys have sort of a a route plan for what your trucks are going to take to and from, say, Route 2 or or whatever? Um, I have, this is Dan, Um, I haven't um, determined a a specific routing, but, you know, I did look at that initially when we took on this project and being that, you know, our, our Mass Ave is a, you know, major arterial for, you know, the area. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure is a truck accessible route. Um, I don't anticipate there being any trouble getting there. It might not be the most direct path to, to exit to the right and then have to, you know, go out a different way that they came in. Uh, I'm just looking up. I don't know the area very well. I'm not from Arlington, but I'm just looking it up on Google right now to just see if anything. I, I have I have the route. Um, just stand by a second. Uh, it's, just, it's just something that might be good to just document so everybody knows that trucks aren't just going to go down the intersection and try to bag a U-turn. I mean, I would for, I would foresee, you know, if they need to get, if they have to go back, to, obviously, to um, to the west, that they would go down to the next block and or a, a block where they can you know, obviously make their way back to the West as opposed to, like you said, trying to, trying to bang a Yui. Um, yeah, Matt, so, so what, what would be a good idea, maybe just jot that down and just put it to paper. And then what we can do is what we don't want to do is people, trucks getting through the neighborhoods and stuff like that. So pretty standard operation as part of a construction management plan to sort of identify your truck routes. Sounds good. I'm just, I, I do have it here. I'll, I'll okay. uh, Keep going and I'll come back to that. All right. And then the other thing, just quick question. So the arrangement on your gates is a little a little odd. Um, is there a reason why you just didn't extend the lines of this along your property line straight out to the street and just come in through a sliding gate on both sides? Uh, two reasons. One on the west side, the bus stop. So we didn't want to shrink the bus stop by 25 feet. And if we did come straight out, you know, along the the property line to the bike lane, then, um, you know, the, the turn to negotiate the bus into an area that's now only like 55 feet or not, you know, the 60 or 80 feet that it is, um, would be more difficult for the bus. So that's one part. The other part is looking at the way trucks would get in here. Um, even a single unit truck, like a concrete truck or a lumber delivery truck or something like that, if it was driving down Mass Ave and trying to make a right turn into the site, um, you know, without crossing the double yellow line, it would need to be a very wide gate. Um, so by having them at this angle like this, it allows the trucks to come in more naturally. Uh, and, you know, the intent is to, you know, pull the trucks into the middle front of the site, offload them, and then they exit out the other side. Actually, Dan, what I was thinking was if you had a gate that was perpendicular to the travel way on either side. Oh, oh. Um, that that could work. It would actually make um, a- entry easier, although um, we would probably impact some of the existing parking area to the east of the um, cr- the crosswalk that's shown on the screen right yep. now yep. because of the way the truck would swing to get in there. Right. Um, the, the, the reason I ask is just you know, those gates and that arrangement, I just don't know how you're going to pre- prevent them from swinging out into the street potentially. So you know, that, that, I mean, they can't be sliding gates because of the way they're oriented. So there right. have to be swing gates and right. You know, you, I can just see those things getting blown out into the street. Um, so. uh, if I could, so those gates are, um, are removable fence panels. So they're not going to necessarily be um, swinging gates. My envision right. would be disassembling those gates on a daily basis and opening you know, opening up. And then, you know, when we don't have active, we would be, you know, having cones um, and barrels, you know, blocking those if we didn't have any anything active going on or people entering or exiting. Okay. Um, so that was my thought process for avoiding what you you just mentioned. Um, and right. if I could, if I could just jump back to the routing, um, so predominantly you know coming from ninety five, um, we would be using three um, A, uh, which is Cambridge Street, which is a state roadway, uh, up to Lexington Street, which is a state roadway, um, and then from Lexington to Ridge Street, 
and then to Forest Street and then to Mass Ave uh, would be the predominant route for the majority of uh, the deliveries um, you know, to the site. And then we will certainly get back to you about you know the, the best way for that truck to be able to uh, navigate back to the west um, you know, to get back out the same way they came in. Okay. So Matt, based on your description, you, you expect to always have like a spotter there for trucks leaving? Absolutely. Okay. I think that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I do have a couple questions. Mr. Romer, uh, please. And uh, I, I apologize, I haven't had a whole lot of time to review it, so these will be in um, not completely orderly fashion, but the things that popped out while I was reviewing it earlier today. And uh, it may be that I, I think I get the drift of most of the emphasis of this plan, which is uh, sort of the nuts and bolts of building. So a few of these are related to that, then a few questions are just wondering where other aspects of uh, uh, either pre-construction or during construction would show up. Um, I, I noticed you did have a note in the in your big note page about uh, protection of the wires. Is that something you're assuming will happen? There's a note in there that the protection of, of those utility lines wouldn't cost the, the town any money is kind of how I read it. I'm, I'm wondering, are you anticipating doing that and needing that? Uh, we, we, we do anticipate doing that in the event that we would need it. Yeah. Um, another comment is, and I, I'm not sure this has come up in, in any of the previous hearings, uh, it, particularly on the east side of the site, uh, there's a lot of vegetation on the neighboring lot on the east side. I don't know exactly where it is. It doesn't, um, you know, it's not really covered up in the landscape plans. And I'm just wondering if any kind of tree protection uh, strategy is part of this construction management plan or when that would happen. Specifically in areas where you're excavating and potentially damaging roots on trees on the neighboring site. Where are you? I, I, I'm, I'm confused as to where you're referencing, sir. On the, on the eastern side, it looks like on the western side, once you're back into your site, it's mainly a parking lot. Um, but on the eastern side, as you work back in your site, I think there are a number of trees that are, it looks at least from Google, I don't have a survey of it, but it looks like there are trees uh, that if they're in an area being excavated, they're on the neighbor's site they could potentially require some root pruning or some other measures uh, to ensure that they're not damaged. Could we zoom in on the sort of the southeast corner of the proposed fence? Yes. Um... You're talking about street, street trees or are you talking? No, 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 along the property line to the east, your neighbor. So there's this the 14 east. inch, there's, the tree there that you're showing the construction that, fence going like, through? That's on our property. That's on their property. But if you go further north. But are, is that tree being maintained or is it being removed? It's being removed. Okay. Yeah. I'm. What I'm talking about is to the right of where that fence line is, where there may be. I don't really know. I'm just looking at the aerial photographs. It looks like there are trees that could be very close to the property line in well, zone if, where you if, would if, be excavating. If there was a tree that was not intended to be taken down because it wasn't on our property, we would adjust our construction fencing and or our permanent fencing to accommodate those. And we would certainly be sensitive to roots, you know, during the installation of the, of that fen those fences, you know, the fencing. Matt, can I, can I weigh in here? The deep, the deep uh, excavation doesn't go back as far as the building. So, we're only talking about shallow foundations in the locus of the trees uh, because the, the basement doesn't extend beyond the back of the existing house. Yep. So I, I don't think we're talking about more than a four or five foot dig and the, uh, 
the building line is 10 feet from the property line. So I think we'll have an opportunity to do some root pruning if necessary, but I think we'll be pretty well away from the existing trees on the easterly lot. Uh, yeah, and I, I think that's highly likely. I'm just used to seeing uh, uh, tree protection plants included uh, for you know to assure your neighbor that you won't damage any of their trees. Um, yeah. Yeah. Other, Do we know if there are any over there, Cliff or, or Matt? Has I'm only, it's not on the plants, but if you look there, on Google Earth, there, there's a lot of vegetation back there. Yeah, just just one thing on this subject. I mean, we're we're trying to give the board uh, some detail on a construction management plan, but we're not representing the board that this is a, a full construction management plan that the applicant would typically do with the engineering department and the building department prior to a building permit. Um, you know, this is to demonstrate to the board that the project, the, the constructability of the project, how we would do it, the phasing in a schematic way. Some of these details absolutely will get uh, flushed out as you would normally do as the construction management plan, you know, gets gets finalized. So uh, I, I don't want the board to feel like this is intended to be a presentation of, of the, you know, all that may be required by the Department of Public Works or by the building department when they get into those meetings and they're sitting with one another and 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 going through some details. But certainly if uh, the board felt it necessary to call out a condition that um, careful attention should be paid to um, neighboring trees to make sure they're not damaged during construction, that would be an appropriate um, 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 condition to alert us to so that uh, we can address that concern. Paul, Paul, yeah, that's Paul, exactly Paul, my point. Yeah. If, if I may, there, there's no trees mature enough within the, the limits of our excavation. And in addition to our setback of how many feet, Mike, in that corner? There's 10 feet. So mm -hmm. we, we don't yeah. expect to have any issue there, Matt. I, I understand. Right. Any issue there. But yeah, again, we, we, we I, don't. We don't anticipate an issue that, but if, but there's nothing wrong with saying that if there is, if we find that there is a uh, a tree on the on the eastern part of the site or on the western part of the site that's off our property that that needs to be uh, that we need to be sensitive to, we'll be sensitive to it. Yeah, and and Matt, don't get the wrong idea. I'm not nitpicky, and I'm just Paul uh, hit on exactly why I'm bringing these points up. I, I don't think anybody, I don't have any, again, I don't see the trees on any plan. So I'm not representing that there is an issue. I just want to make sure that the board is uh, sensitized to the, to, to that possibility. And, and obviously we have, we, we, you know, we have to be, we, we're neighbors with, um, you know, this homeowner. And we would certainly never do anything that's going to jeopardize anything on their property whatsoever. And that goes beyond a special permit or what a DPW says or engineering. That that's just just um, being good people, and mm -hmm. that's just being sensible and being practical, you know, construction managers. So I think sure. we can move sure. on. Okay. Um, if, can I keep going? And maybe Please these clear. are okay. <laughs> um, another is a man. Matt mentioned this about the the piling or you know whether cheap piling or, or lag and, and column type uh, earth support on the north or southeast corner. It I just made a note it wasn't on the plan, the installation that wasn't on the construction management plan as part of any phase. So I'd recommend you put that in there. I don't know if you know yet which method you're going to use. You mentioned both piling and uh, pile and lag systems. A couple other points. Um, I thought it was interesting that the, uh, uh, the chair brought up the question about uh, the putting signage so that pedestrians coming from the east would know that the bus stop is still active. I think that's a great idea. I flagged it in a little different way. I was just wondering, and I don't know your tolerances out front of the building, but 
I don't know if you can, if you have enough space to have a walkway, that, a protected walkway, or, if, or whether that would take too much space out of your uh, staging area in the front. It's just a note I made so that people walking from the east wouldn't have to cross the street and then recross the street to get to the bus stop. So we evaluated that exact point very, very carefully um, and uh, paid attention to how much real estate a protected pedestrian lane to preserve that. Um, it does take up a, a, a more a lot of real estate. Um, we also have concern that even if it's protected, you're still having pedestrians walk directly by a construction site, which we would, mm -hmm. which we think it's just more prudent and 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 provide better public safety to ask them to, to cross the street. Yeah, okay. Um, there is a note on the, on the sheet too about construction workers not parking on residential streets in the town. Do you have a parking plan for the workers? Yes, the, the, the workers are gonna park on the, uh, on, in what will become the parking garage. You have the entire parking garage that, that's the first thing that's gonna be done is the parking garage slab is gonna be poured and it's a 50 car garage and we don't anticipate the utilization of, uh, of all those spaces during construction by construction workers. So we yeah. fully expect there's not gonna be a heavy burden on off-street parking. We're not representing to the board that if a particular vendor is coming by the site uh, to do an inspection or do something for an hour, then they find, a, they see a, a street spot open, they're not just gonna park in the street spot and come walk yeah. onto the site and then leave. We, we're not We're not gonna say that that won't happen, but. From our observations, there's not a heavy demand on parking during the day in this particular neighborhood. The, the streets, um, the curb, curbside parking is is fairly wide open and, and easy to access. So Paul, ahead of ahead of when that that those garage spaces are available, you know, still quite a bit of work to do. You're anticipating that the workers would park on the curbside. Well, it, or, or they'll park on the site, you know, um, in portions of the site when it's gravel. I mean, it's it's not that small a site to 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 locate some uh, cars off off site. Uh, but you're right, Sean. I mean, I'm not going to say that there'll never be any off off site parking in the beginning. It's just there's not there's there's not an expectation of heavy demand. Matt, you could probably speak to how many uh, construction workers you're going to have there before. You know the site is um, that slab is poured. It's 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 not it's not dozens of people. No, and you know they're in urban projects. Um, subcontractors are sensible about um, you know car sharing and and you know car pooling and um, you know they they're you know they, that's what they do. Um, you know to for these projects, uh, but yes, I mean until the point that you have a you know a, a drivable surface. You know you're talking about you know a concrete vendor. Um, you're talking about a site contractor. Um, you're talking about uh, a um, a plumber, um, and obviously, you know, Majuri's personnel. So, um, you know, at any one time during that you know initial phase until we have a you know a parking area established, you know, you might have you know ten cars on site, or ten vehicles on site, plus you know the heavy equipment. Um, Matt, would it be a possibility to uh, discuss with the? condominium association who owns the property behind yours to see about renting the spaces that are adjacent to your property for that purpose? Uh, they were very, um, you know, we're, we're um, I don't want to make that commitment. Uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very close to getting our access agreement um, and our mitigation signed up with them. I'm hoping to have that agreement back next week. Okay. Uh, and so I, I think those spaces are assigned to the unit owners. Those, so are, not, those are deeded. Those are deeded spaces. Yeah. Oh, so they are. A, okay. It's not a condominium. So the condominium association doesn't control those spaces. So. And they and they've also they've also been. I mean, you know, we could ask them if we could maybe put something up on a bullet, bulletin board saying if you if you're not using your space and you want to rent it, you know, to this project. I mean, it's just uh, it's not something that's re really viable. Um, you know, with being deeded spaces. Um, and you know we're 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 working on a um, you know a much more important ask in my opinion, which is to get the mitigation um, committed so we can we can make that a condition of this project. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. You, do you guys know if if there are there meters on Mass Ave or there are, no there no. there are not any meters in this immediate oh, area. No, they're two. It's two hour parking. Right? Oh, it is two hour parking. Yeah, yeah. I think okay. so. So so that's that's a that's a pretty good control against you. Know, yeah, this the, is Dan from Vanessa. If I, if I can just add that you know these comments are kind of like a boilerplate that we start with and then we massage them into the, each site. So that note is kind of more to, to indicate that, you know, we're not going to have our construction workers like park around the corner, you know, on a residential street um, that doesn't have parking restrictions. You know, that, that's the intent of that, um, to that note. So, mm -hmm. you know, the discussions with Matt and with Paul was that, you know, we're going to accommodate the parking on the site um, as much as possible. Um, so, just to add a little bit of understanding of where that note came from. But Dan, you're, you, that's correct to say that there's a two hour parking limit on Mass Ave, right? I'm looking at Street View right now, and I know I did see a sign that said that. I'm not sure if it's all that. Let me just see. There's one, um, two or three houses. Okay. Actually, right in front of the site, there's a sign that says two hour parking. Um, which will be an area that we're going to take take away. And um, let me just see if I can find another one. Yeah, across the street, um, same thing. Okay. Two hour parking limit. Um, I'll keep going. Please. <laughs> you know, mind this is all in uh, trying to be helpful. So I hope you can take it that way. And uh, sheet four. Um, which is where the demolition phase happens. Um, I, I'm sure that this will be in any spec related to building demolition, um, but I didn't see a note about dust control and whether you have you know, a, a temporary water supply or how you intend to control dust that might be generated from building demolition. We, we intend to intercept one of the domestic water lines um, on a temporary basis um, that feeds one of the existing homes and um, you know get that into a um, a um, into a ground box you know with a silcock so we have the ability in a meter so we have the ability to um, use that for temporary water for demo terrific um, you know and again I think I'm making points here to help uh, maybe add a few more lines and if you edit this document, uh, on sheet five, I just thought it would be useful, I think, to, to the architect's point of indicating uh, where the basement is, or at least somewhere so everybody understands very well where the extent of that deep excavation is. And it relates to the point one on sheet five. Um, I understand that you are you may have you maybe you haven't settled on your earth support system yet but that neighbor is very close i don't know if you've figured out whether they have a basement or not and whether your wall actually whether you need to leave your your sheet piling in place to uh so that you're not uh disturbing the structure of the foundation of the house next door or whatever it might be um I think we talked about this before. I don't know if you've gotten to that point and whether that will inform the, the uh, earth support system you might use in that area. Uh, we have not gotten to that point yet. And again, you know, uh, a, a design of this nature, in my opinion, and Paul can chime in, um, you know, would be something well beyond the limits of, um, you know, a, a 40B comprehensive permit. And, you know, that's, again, um, something that we could take as a condition that, you know, we, ha we have to, um, you know, have, um, you know, indicate what our support uh, methods are going to be um, to either the building part and department or wh whoever in town, um, you know, is interested in knowing about. And obviously it would be engineered um, and it would be uh, overseen by a professional engineer as they always are. Well, I think that that's the best point, Matt, that I think it, it's a suitable condition that is, you know, uh, putting off when it's actually investigated as, as long as you're willing to provide support to the building department who may not be really qualified to, you know, to understand uh, structures adequately or geotechnical issues adequately. 
to review your proposal. Um, another question is then on page six. And this is, I guess one question is, and I think you, you talked about this before, you're looking at, at stick framing, right? Not panelized? Um, yes. Okay. And, and so this uh, just a question, and it really is, this is not an opinion, so don't hear it that way. Uh, I'm just interested in why on, in phase 3A, you're using a crane and then you're happy to use a forklift in the subsequent phase where you don't have space for a crane. Is it, it speeds it up or what's the logic? So the crane obviously um, is used to be able to build the rear half of the building. Yeah. Because you, have, you have the lay down area for the crane, you have the, the reach and you know that you can accelerate. Once you, you mean, you can't set up a, um, we're not gonna be able to set up a crane because of the overhead power uh, yeah. on how to have to erect the front half of the building. So that's where we're changing to be able to, to build our way out of, you know, frame our way out of this building, um, you know, from that midpoint out to Mass Ave, you know, using, using uh, forklifts or um, articulating um, uh, boom lifts, excuse, I mean, um, lulls. Uh, yeah. To hang the balance of that steel. Um, okay. Yeah, the, the, again, this wasn't an opinion, I was just, Curious why one was one way and then the second yeah. was the other way. Good question. Um, that's all I've got. Hey, Cliff, thank you very much. Um, I do see, um, so Susan Chapnick is the chair of the Conservation Commission um, and she's with us this evening and has her hand raised. So I would go ahead and recognize her as chair of the Conservation Commission. Susan. Um, thank, thank you, Christian. I appreciate, um, I, I only have one small comment because I don't see um, the rest of the, uh, the updated plans for the mitigation area, which is more within the purview of the Conservation Commission. But I just wanted to make a comment about, um, there was some storage of materials um, back behind the building that was um, was said was a storage area. And I just want to make um, everyone aware that we have uh, conditions and standards on storing things in resource areas. And I can't really see the resource lines um, on my screen. It's kind of a little too small. So I just want to make that comment to, to make sure everybody's aware that wherever materials are going to be stored or equipment stored would have to be evaluated if it's a resource area and um, we'd come to some uh, conditions or conclusions on that. Yeah, I, I, I think that the, uh, the, the area of where the stormwater management system is gonna go, which is going to be a, a, a quote unquote staging area. So there'll be some storage back there is within the outer uh, second 100 feet of the riverfront um, area. And when we uh, present the notice of intent and we work through um, the local order of conditions through this permit, um, if there's particular um, uh, measures, mitigation measures that uh, should be uh, flushed out, we'll do that with LEC. Uh, to make sure that you know erosion or or any um, uh, impacts uh, are are mitigated. So we'll we'll bring that up with Rich Kirby, um, um, so that we're we're ahead of it when we're before the Conservation Commission uh, with the notice of intent filing. Um, but we'll also be able to then uh, tie it back into this process under the local permit. That sounds great. Thanks, Paul. And I do understand from Rich that the Conservation Commission is expected to receive a, the notice of intent under the Wetlands Protection Act for this project for our March 16th public that, meeting. That's correct. Um, we're, right. We're aware of when it needs to be submitted in advance. And Rich has, uh, we know he's working on it. And we were waiting to get to the um, the, 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 the civil plans with the building set and, and things a little bit more firmed up before we made that filing, but now we, we feel like we can do it. 
That sounds great. So I would just um, just caution that um, though you said at the beginning that you believe tonight the ZBA will have you will have presented the full scope of the project for the ZBA's consideration. But I would just caution that it's not the full scope of the project because we have not looked at the wet the wetlands, the NOI yet. A hundred percent. And we'll keep Thank you. public hearing is going to be kept open as we've articulated so that what whatever happens during the public hearing process at the CONCOM on the State Wetlands Act can help facilitate the zoning board with regard to the comprehensive permit. Uh, we're not asking that the public hearing be be closed. We've already committed that we're going to coordinate those two steps. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Ms. Chapman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Measuring. Uh, I might request that, that we ask the public that, um, if they have any comments relative, once we get to the, the public, we do um, around on any discussions regarding the CMP so that if there's no further discussion, we can um, let Dan off the call. Absolutely. Uh, let me first do one last round. Um, are, is there anyone else from the board who has questions in regards to uh, what we have seen this evening on the construction plans? I'm not seeing anyone. Is there, are there any representatives from any other town boards or commissions who have questions or comments in regards to the construction plans? Again, seeing none. Um, so as we've done on the past couple of uh, hearings, um, we will go ahead and uh, sort of split up the public comment for the evening. We'll take a section, a session of it now in relation specifically to the construction plans um, that we have been discussing this evening and the construction impacts on the neighborhood and on Massachusetts Avenue. And then um, afterwards, then we can, as, as uh, Matt Majuri mentioned, we can let his uh, engineers go at that time and then we'll move on to the, the next section of tonight's hearing. So for that, um, so tonight's hearing will shortly be opened for public comment. But before we do so, I want to review ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. Public questions and comments will only be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Due to previously demonstrated interest in this project and to provide for an orderly flow to the meeting, the chair asks individual public speakers to limit their comments and to use their time to provide comment related solely to the topics discussed this evening. Please note there will be multiple hearings scheduled for this project and each hearing has an opportunity for public comment. The chair also encourages the public to provide a written comment to be reviewed by the board and included in the record. The chair will ask members of the public who have previously identified themselves by logging in through Zoom who wish to speak can, may digitally raise their hand using the raise hand button in the participant tab in the Zoom application. You'll be called upon by myself. You may you'll unmute yourself and then you'll be asked to give your name and address for the record and then be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly, concisely, and in a way that helps generate an accurate record of the meeting. Those calling in by phone may dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. When called upon, you may unmute your line. Please identify yourself by name and address for the record. You'll be given up to given the time for your questions and comments and all questions that are to be addressed through the chair. And once all public uh, questions and comments have been addressed or we have reached the hour of 9.15, the public comment period for this evening's hearing will be closed. And as noted previously, there multiple hearings are scheduled for this project. So with that, um, the first member of the public wishing to speak uh, is Winnell Evans. Thank you, Winnell Evans, 20 Orchard Place. Um, a very quick question. I've never been inside either house, but given their, the era of their construction, I would imagine there's probably some really nice woodwork and other detailing in there. And I'm wondering if there are any plans for any recycling or reuse of any materials. Um, and on the larger scale, 
what what is the destination of these two houses that's being demolished? Will will the entirety go into a landfill? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Um, uh, Matt, I don't know if you knew sure. answers to that. Yeah, I can jump on into that. Uh, good evening, Ms. Evans. Um, so um, we haven't had a chance to do much investigation into the homes, um, but we have done some um, historical projects or projects with, with historical significance um, that have you know some of the moldings and some of the the um, older um, design elements that you referenced, and you know we have brought companies in to um, remove and repurpose those those items. So that would be our intention, obviously, you know, minimizing uh, waste and, you know, weight in our dumpsters. Um, the other, the balance of the general refuse, um, you know, be handled, um, you know, through a demolition contractor and, um, you know, brought to, to waste facilities. Um, that's that's beyond our the general contractor's knowledge of, you know, exactly where it goes, but uh, we know they're going to, you know, license facilities um, and dispose of in a, in a, you know, compliant manner. With regard to state law. Great, thank you, Ms. Evans. Do you have anything further? I hope you're on mute. Sorry. I'm sorry. I just want to very briefly comment that this is becoming a little bit more of a recognized issue, and I believe Portland, Oregon, has um, instituted a bylaw that requires you know X amount of construction waste to be recycled. Uh, when possible. So, so something to think about down the line. Thank you. Um, Thank the, you. Uh, just to mention the concrete, obviously any concrete slabs and um, concrete foundation walls, et cetera, um, would, would be, just, you know, would be recycled um, in lieu of, you know, taken to a landfill. Thank you. And if I, if I remember correctly, I believe there's Massachusetts has like somewhere between six and eight different construction materials that are not allowed to be disposed of and have to be recycled as a part of demolition procedures? Um, Matt, I don't know if you know. Yes, I, I believe you are. I don't know. Uh, I believe you are correct. I don't know the ins and outs of that because, again, you know, it's 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 sorted out, um, you know, by a, a, a third party, you know, we're, we, we that we subcontract to. And um, but, I, you know, whatever they're doing is obviously, you know, done again in a, in a, in a code compliant state, you know, state mm -hmm. law compliant. Perfect, thank you. Um, next on our speaker list, uh, Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, actually, just to quickly piggyback on Ms. Evans' comment, um, and these being old homes, um, has an inspection been done for asbestos and it will be handled appropriately in demolition? Yeah, so state law requires uh, before this demolition of any building that you have to survey for any asbestos containing materials or, or um, the, the phrase is suspicious asbestos containing or suspect uh, asbestos containing materials. So there'll, there'll be a, uh, an asbestos survey done before demolition. Uh -huh. Identified asbestos containing materials will be abated before demolition. That's a requirement of uh, Massachusetts regulations. And and the uh, the hazmat study has been completed. Um, we have a very limited amount of asbestos containing material in some pipe insulation and in some um, vinyl asbestos tile, nine by nine tile that is beneath some um, some old you know some carpeting, uh, which is very common in buildings of this age. And again, as Paul alluded to, um, we we cannot get a demolition permit. Um, until we have uh, provided evidence that a hazmat report has been prepared, that the mitigation has been completed um, with all applicable bills of ladings and uh, transportation uh, data and clean air testing. Thank you both. Mr. Moore? Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, that's, uh, that's excellent. I just, I was unaware of how that works. Uh, but, but my main comment really is, could you uh, once again on this sheet, uh, a zoom in on the back section of the property like you were doing uh, earlier. Yep, give me one second. Uh, and my question, my question is this, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you could uh, elaborate further on how that back section is going to be used. I, I'm wondering first, is that, is that a, a mound now that has been contoured there and back? I'm not quite sure what's going on there, but uh, how is that going to be utilized during the construction period? 
That, that's a temporary um, detention basin in order to, during construction, before the infiltration system is operative, we have to manage storm <laughs> runoff and not have any offsite impacts uh, to stormwater runoff during the um, construction period. So as was presented uh, at our last um, uh, public hearing by our civil engineer, when we went through the phases of construction, uh, uh, Mr. Moore, you may have missed it. This is actually a, a temporary detention basin that will be installed first. And then when the infiltration system, the subsurface infiltration system comes online, um, the that area of the property obviously is going to be redeveloped into that in, into the into the mitigated uh, open space, and it will be uh, re regraded uh, in accordance with the finished landscape plan. Um, and and then the area that uh, that is occupied by the subsurface infiltration infiltration system is basically a flat plateau. So that retaining wall that you see is going to be one of the first items that gets built um, in the in the in the construction process, and and that's going to be a a, a flat level uh, area. Um, the the infiltration system will be installed. It's been low tested, um, and it's been um, uh, the specs of the infiltration system from the design of the system. And, and Mike Novak can speak to this, our civil engineer. It's been, uh, we've been, we've given them all the loads that could potentially uh, um, be stored in that area so that we know the infiltration system will be unaffected by the staging that we plan to do there. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Moore? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One, one last question then. To build the uh, temporary retention area, uh, I assume all the trees have to go. Yes, all the trees are, yeah. all the, virtually all the trees on the property are going to be cleared and stumps are going to be removed as one of the first site preparation activities. Okay, well, I, I've heard a number of times or, or actually various comments from um, um, the Tetra folks about how a tree, you know, some of the trees should be maintained, but it sounds like really on the property, kind of no trees are going to be retained. Is that correct? Yes, I think we've been upfront about that for several meetings now. Oh, that, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that the, um, that the uh, existing trees are going to be removed, and and you know the and as we presented, and as I I, I know you you've helped us uh, with your comments, Mr. Moore. The the proposed landscaping reconstruction of the of the uh, uh, native species habitat will, will be restored, um, and it's being done in a way that uh, while it will take a number of years to mature. It's, it's going to be quite robust even in the beginning. And then we're going to have the, the maintenance plans that we talked about to ensure that that area matures the way everybody expects. All right, thank, thank you, Mr. Feldman. I, um, uh, that is true. We have, we have talked about this earlier, but when I, when I just, whenever I hear that statement of all the trees on that property coming down, that's, that's really, <laughs> but I understand that's how you build a building. So, uh, yeah, no, I, we're sensitive to every time we say it, we know what we're doing to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's it. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to address this portion of tonight's hearing? Um, do not see anyone wishing to address the board. So I'll go ahead and close the public comment period uh, for this portion of the hearing. Um, when Ms. Ms. Evans spoke, it reminded me to, um, when we were talking about the construction plan where people are gonna be parking, um, that, uh, that Arlington does have a large number of private ways um, and that parking is not allowed on private ways. And I think it would just be, um, and whatever instructions that are being provided to the, uh, the workers on the site that they be made aware of that, that's that situation and that they, you know, especially in this first part phase of the construction where there's no, where there's limited ability to find all day parking, um, that 
you know, private ways are, are not an acceptable alternative. We'll, we'll um, make sure that our subcontracts are aware of that. Perfect. Thank you. Absolutely. So, Dan, you could stop sharing your screen. Um, okay. And uh, we, we appreciate you being here tonight. Um, and uh, Mr. Chair, if you want us to move on, um, we're ready to do that. If, Certainly. Um, okay. Um, so the other two topics we want to present tonight um, uh, is from our civil engineer, uh, uh, Mike Novak, and from our architect, uh, Chris Mulhern. And uh, I think I think it makes sense uh, while everybody's still fresh that Chris, you present some of the um, uh, work you've done, taking into account the feedback we got two weeks ago in terms of the front plaza design. Um, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Paul. Christopher Mulhern for Harrison Mulhern Architects. We're the project architects. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, you should be all set. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Excellent. Uh, let's see if I can make this go. Yeah. So uh, last time we presented some ideas about uh, how we might change the layout of the building and the layout of the front plaza to improve it. Um, we talked about moving the building back and moving it to the right. Um, We've increased the front setback to re, you know, reduce the presence on the street. We've reduced the building width to 135 feet per our discussion last time. And after talking to the fire department, um, the, the fire department was uh, in, indifferent, if you will. It's not the right exact word, but they were, they were not uh, exercised one way or the other as to where to put the additional setback space. So what we've decided to do is to take the advice of the board and put it on the west side of the property. So here uh, you can see the updated um, front plaza layout. On the right-hand side here is a 10-foot setback. That's the uh, minimum in the bylaw. On the left-hand side, we've taken the additional two feet that we gained by reducing the width of the building and increased this west side or left side setback to 15 feet. The building has moved back from the street by 3.6 feet so that we're now 20.3 feet uh, at the left-hand corner, putting us behind the three-story apartment building to the west of our site. And we're 17 feet back on the right-hand side, putting us more or less in line with the existing house. So, We've also, we think we've improved the design of the plaza. Based on the feedback last week, we've reduced the uh, size of the seating area. We've relocated the seating area and we've added street trees. So here's a diagram, site diagram of the proposal for the front plaza. Starting on the left-hand side, you can see that there's a small seating area with two benches that basically straddles the path that leads to the back of the building. This lets us uh, increase the planted area to the right here between the walkway and the benches and the driveway. So we've gotten that to be a little bit wider. It's wide enough now to put two trees into. Uh, and then on the right side of the drive, we kept the tree that we had to the left of the vault uh, we kept the two trees that we had flanking the entrance and we added another street tree in the plaza area in front of the retail space. So now we have a total of six uh, trees across the front of the site with a smaller uh, sitting area to the right. Here's the uh, landscape plan layout drawing that shows the materials. So the walkway uh, is uh, bituminous concrete the seating area is uh, surrounded by a granite curb and has concrete unit pavers in it. The drive itself is bituminous with granite curbing on both sides. And then starting to the right of this driveway tree, if you will, is a, an area of pavement, which is, um, again, concrete unit pavers with 
one, two, three uh, tree wells in the paved area. The bike racks uh, live between the driveway trees and the entry trees uh, in the same locus as the uh, subterranean transformer vault. We've also revised the plant material based on the feedback that we got last time. We've changed the trees from ornamental cherries to, uh, to shade tree. We've added some uh, shrubs and we've added some additional structural soil to try to uh, ensure the uh, viability of the, of the street trees. So here's the updated uh, planting plan from Kyle Zink's uh, drawing set. You can see that there's one, two, three, four, five, six street trees along uh, the front. There's an area of shrubbery in here. There's an area of shrubbery on the other side here. There's a bank of yews on the right side here. This is the plant list. Uh, so we have, uh, we have some Rosa Sharon, we have some Inkbury, we have some knockout roses. And the main feature that we have are these ginkgo biloba street trees. This is a variety called, a, uh, let me just check here. It's called the Princeton Sentry ginkgo. Now, I don't know if you know about ginkgos. Ginkgos are an ancient tree. They've been around for 270 million years. Uh, fossilized the ginkgo leaves have been found in, from the Cretaceous period uh, along with dinosaurs. This particular variety, this Princeton century, is uh, a taller, uh, more upright variety. Uh, Kyle picked these because they're an excellent uh, street tree. They're very rugged. They've been around forever. Uh, they grow nicely. They, these, this variety grows tall. Uh, they turn a, a lovely golden color in the fall, uh, and they'll provide uh, much more shade than uh, what we had previously, which were a more a, a lower ornamental tree. So that's the story. Um, again, uh, trees, these are uh, shrubs in here. The grasses are in between and in the tree wells, there's some grass infills, and then a yew hedge on the left-hand side, making a buffer to the neighbor. That's what I have, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much. Um, speaking personally, I I really appreciate the the adjustments that have been made. Um, very happy to see the additional trees uh, that the trees are more oriented towards shade. Um, I did have a couple of questions. Um, so, at the rear of the property, obviously, where that the urban forest section is very much focused on, you know, native uh, native species. I'm curious if these species are native as well, or if there are species that um, would need either more care or whether they would be more prone to um, you know, encroaching in other areas? Um, I don't know whether these are classified as a native species or not, Christian. They are a typical street tree. They're used uh, throughout the eastern seaboard as a street tree. Um, they're, they're very robust. Uh, and they they survive well in uh, you know polluted environments. So we feel confident that they're going to work pretty well here. I also failed to mention that uh, for the ones that are in this paved area, we've increased the amount of uh, structural soil. So that what's going on here is that from this third tree to the first tree, it's essentially all one planting bed. With, it, with these soils arranged so that the, the root structure of these trees can, can spread out. Um, Kyle feels pretty confident that these are gonna be a great choice for here. They're gonna give us some good height. They're gonna give us some good shade and, uh, and provide, uh, a, a, I like particularly this look where they're in a row, uh, this picture up here where, where we have three or six of them working together. I think it's gonna be very effective. And then, um... You said you're looking at uh, planting euonymus where the path and the, the seating intersects with the sidewalk. Um, what is the heights of those? I, so, I asked. So, so these are, are uh, these TMs. I, I may have misspoken. I believe that is a U. TM is a is a Hicks U. Okay. And they're starting at 36 inches high and four feet on center. 
So they're three feet high to start with. Um, I don't know where they top out, but probably only four to five feet. Okay. I just picture the ewes in front of my house. And <laughs> are they big? They they are badly overgrown. <laughs> Time to chop. <laughs> They do um, have to be managed, it's true. Yeah, okay. Um, and then could you just comment a little bit on what some of the other shrub types were there? Um, yes, uh, let me just go back to the uh, this plan here. So these eight HS here and the eight IGS are, uh, HS is a Rose de Sharon, and then the IGS is a, Shamrock Inkberry. So that's a that's a shrub row at the back of this planted area here. And then there's another bunch of the inkberries on the other side of the driveway. So we have the drive is bookended by the two trees and then these inkberry shrubs behind with the Rose of Sharon to the left. There are also some roses uh, planted in the wells around these trees. Um, let me see where I can find where the, where they wound up. Uh, yeah, there's the, 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 rows arcades, the, the arcade, arcade, yeah. So there's three in here and eight over here. So, uh, okay. and the rest of these are grasses. The CAK is a grass, or the LM is a grass, and those are in and around the trees. Okay. And is there any anticipation that, that irrigation is going to be required or? Yes, we, the intention is irrigation all the way across the frontier. Including the, street, including the street trees as well. Yeah, exactly. So it'll be a drip system. It'll deal with the tree wells. It'll deal with the, the, uh, the shrub areas as well. Okay. And you had said that, so the paver, the paver areas, that's going to be pervious. Is that correct? Uh, we haven't decided on pervious here. Uh, we, the runoff calculations are based on these areas being impervious. Uh, the suggestion that has been made and has not yet been detailed is to try to pitch the pavement so that it drains into these tree wells. Um, that's, that's a pretty high bar for this site because the site paving is generally going to pitch down from the building to the curb line. So I think it's pretty easy to get the part between the building and the tree wells to pitch into the tree wells, but the areas uh, on the sides of the tree wells is going to be a little bit hard to get them to pitch back into mm -hmm. the wells. But that, that's the intention, and we'll work on that in, when we get into the fine grading of this front area. And if they weren't, if the if the water wasn't going towards the the tree wells, where which direction would the water be heading? Uh, it's going to it's running towards the sidewalk, so okay. it th this. This area here, the calculations are, are assuming that it's running towards the sidewalk, but it's less runoff than it's currently going in that direction. Okay. And then it would just sheet across the sidewalk and then to the Correct. To the That's gutter. correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then you had said so by two minutes, so asphalt going into the dry, into the correct. Uh, parking area and up the side of the building as well. Okay. That's correct. Good. Okay, those are the questions I had. Are there questions from the board? I'm not seeing any questions from the board. Um, then reach out, uh, ask uh, Mr. Bomer if he had some questions. I do, I do. <clears throat> um, I want to say I, I really strongly support the increases in the setbacks. I think it makes a big, big difference. And I think you made the right decision in allocating most of the increase to the west side of the building. I think that works really well. Um, the uh, quick point though, I think you can see it on this plan that we're looking at right now. I think the landscape and civil plans may not have picked up that increased setback, because I think if you look in this drawing, you're you're still proud of the neighbor to the west. But I that's think right. 
this yeah. this plan this landscape plan has not been updated for that but the uh if we go back to this guy uh this has got the correct dimension yeah. uh, that's what i thought yeah it, it so i'd recommend coordinating those plans just so the board knows uh what is the right plan uh the uh I'm a big supporter of ginkgo trees, uh, both their long heritage and their suitability for street trees. Uh, I would recommend probably specifying male ginkgos versus yeah, we, male. Yeah, we got you on that. We, we don't want the females. We don't like the the, the fruit. Uh, so that uh, what I'm on, what I've been told is that uh, the females generally never leave the nursery anymore at least in new england <laughs> That's they're, they're, they're confined to the to the nurseries to do their to do their work uh but yes they'll be male ginkgos for sure terrific and i've got a couple questions and a couple suggestions Please. um one is i noticed on the um elevations and the roof plans that the, it looks like roof access is limited to a hatch and I think that is smart on the on the south side of the building, but just as a suggestion, I think your management company might like you a lot better if you actually provide a stair access, if it's possible, on the south side where the penthouse wouldn't um, uh, be so obvious. It's just I'll throw it out there: the the elevations do look better, and that rendering, the street rendering, looks a lot better with the lowered elevator. So oh, our intention oh, is, the elevator. sorry, Cliff, uh, no, it's okay. to cut you off, but uh, the intention as far as the roof access is to use an alternating tread stair uh, at the top of both of the egress stairs and then use a um, uh, 30 by 96 inch hatch so that okay. uh, you can actually, it's a, it's a walk up, it's not a ship's ladder kind of setup, it's a big hatch, it's a, an alternating tread ladder, so Without having to build a doghouse up above, we still have good access to the high roof. And Perfect. more than 50% of the roof is at the fifth floor level. So that's walkout condition uh, all right. the way around. Right. Okay. Well, I was just putting that out there as an option. I don't think it would be a, an aesthetic issue if you did decide you needed it on the north side of the building. Um, one, I think there's something funny in the drawings with the elevations. Um, if you look at the rear elevation there, we know your intention is for an at grade egress from the garage onto yes. that filled area in the back. But if you look at your west elevation, the left elevation, you're showing a low grade on that side. So I think some, unless I'm reading the drawing incorrectly, I think the left elevation may not be accurate. Okay, uh, I will take a look at that. I don't have those on my screen tonight, but um, the the notion is that that um, the back area over the uh, stormwater management plan uh, slopes gently from west to east. So right. the grade at the northwest corner is lower than the walkout grade. I don't know whether I have it drawn correctly at the right elevation yet, but I will certainly check. Okay, that. all right, I appreciate that. Um, another comment is, uh, I had the impression it, it uh, but I'll, I'll just say it, is that um, when I had brought up the question about uh, the specifics, more specific information about the cementitious siding, I thought you'd indicated that you were using uh, a material that was homogeneous. The color was homogeneous throughout the thickness of the material. And in this generation of drawings, I'm noticing that there are areas of uh, painted uh, cementitious panels. And I'm wondering if that's, is that intentional or are you mixing, mixing materials on purpose or? There's, there's one, uh color that we can't get in the uh in the integral into integrally colored panel material so there is one of the finished materials that that is a pink finish that that's where we are right now yes okay and that might be it the i had a couple comments oh i know what there is another comment i, I do want to make and with all 
complete understanding about there's a whole nother level of review that happens when this goes in for permitting. But the reason I'm just gonna keep pushing this button a little bit on a preliminary code review is I think everybody just wants to be sure that you're not going to learn something kind of fundamental about the design uh, from the building department that would force you to change the plans that the board is looking at. It doesn't mean it couldn't be that you can't revise your uh, decision later on. And I, I think uh, my recommendation is is uh, just because I've run in this to uh, run into this a bunch of times myself is really confirming egress requirements from places like the uh, storage areas, uh, even the roof decks that are greater than 500 square feet, just making sure that you're totally set on the code issues that could potentially change uh, change a floor plan. So I, I, I'll, I'll just leave. It. Okay, I'll just leave it at that because you're absolutely right, and you consistently point out that you need to meet code, and that's absolutely true. Uh, I think I'll just make one other comment because I know. Um, I know you wanted to end at 9:15 or so. Uh, in the in the um, in your code review, the egress includes accessible egress because I, I hit on this before, and you mentioned using battery power. I just have never been able to do that to maintain an accessible egress path from your top floor. Uh, but again, uh, it's I'll put it to you. Uh, the only change I would ever have is just you would need to include an emergency generator as opposed to a battery. And you've got roof real estate where you could do that. Oh, yes. um, in, invert, inverter, uh, power inverters to power emergency lighting um, is, is more than co-compliant, which, which renders. That's true. That is true. The, the, it's the elevator that, that I'm, I'm concerned about. The, the elevator is a traction elevator that has what's called a battery rescue device. And this also is, is approved within the state elevator code. Um, and it has enough battery life that in the event of a power failure, the elevator will go down to the lobby and open the doors. And that's very standard on- uh, No, that's, that's totally right, Matt, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, a, is a, an accessible means of egress, which means that in a power outage, the elevator doesn't just go down to the bottom floor. It allows egress from somebody who gets out of their unit after the power outage and the battery would have dropped the elevator down. Uh, it's a different part of the code. But I'll, take, I'll take a look at that. Um, I, okay. I, I, hear you, I hear what you're saying, okay. Um, the only other comments I had, um, I appreciate that you, you submitted that sustainability letter it covered a bunch of things that we talked about. Um, one of the uh, uh, neighbors, I think, was asking about a, a percentage of recycling. You do mention that in your plan, you don't have a specific um, percentage. Uh, I just might suggest that you commit to, to a percentage of uh, construction waste that might include uh, some of the, the waste from the demolition. Uh, but I think that's all I had for now. Again, I apologize for not having a lot of time to, to review this materials, but I genuinely appreciate the, the moves you've made on the setbacks and, and the revised planting plans. I think the building really benefits from that and the, and the neighborhood does too. Thanks for your input, Cliff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I uh, wanted to offer Sean Rudin if he had any comments on this as well. I think I'm all set, Christian. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, just to follow up on one of the questions that uh, Cliff had posed, um, uh, was the the cementitious siding and the one color that needs to be painted rather than being a through color. Uh, where on the building is that, and, and is it in a location where it can readily be maintained? Uh, good question. Uh, I, I can tell you, it's a, you didn't have the elevations uh, in front of you. Christian, it's on the front elevations and the, where you see that the horizontal patterning, that's, it looks like it's about 18 inch reveal, maybe two foot reveal. 
Okay. Like that. Those horizontal areas are the painted, um, uh, painted siding. I think I got that right. Yeah, it is. And then on the rear elevation, there's a a larger area of painted siding. Right. right. Okay. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Are there any questions from the board? Um, just for just for the benefit of the public. Um, so the the applicant had submitted yesterday afternoon um, some revised plans, uh, which the um, the consultants have had an opportunity to review. Um, I've been working with the town to get those posted to the town's website, but where they, the final bit of those drawings came in basically 24 hours before this hearing. And so um, we've not been able, I don't, honestly, I haven't had a chance to look at the website in the last couple hours to see if those have been able to be posted. But if if not, they are, we are in the process of having those posted. We will absolutely discuss them at the, at the next hearing. Um, and then also the project sustainability report that was mentioned that was released uh, today. And so uh, we are getting that posted as well. And I fully intend to have that as a, as a topic at the following hearing. So just in case you, you're hearing about these for the first time and you're wondering where they are, um, that's the status of those. They just arrived very, uh, very close to the, the time of this hearing. We just haven't had an opportunity to get them fully up on the town's website, but they will be there shortly if they're not there already, and then they will also uh, be a topic at the following hearing. Um, are there any anything further from any members of the board? Seeing none, um, I will go ahead and uh, reopen the hearing for public comment. Um, just in an abbreviated format, uh, members of the public wish to speak to um, to what we've discussed in the second portion of the hearing. Uh, please use the raise hand button in the participants tab in the Zoom application, or if you're calling in, you may use you may dial star nine to indicate you'd like to be added to the queue, and you'll be recognized by the chair. Ask to identify yourself by name and address for the record, and then you'll be given time for your questions and comments. Um, we will. Uh, leave this period open until um, we are done with public comment or we have reached uh, 945. So with that, um, the first name and the speaker's queue is Mr. Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, uh, I want to uh, applaud and thank the applicant and, and his team for what they've done here. This is, a, this is a great improvement to the front of the building from my perspective, uh, moving the building back, adding trees, um, it, it, it's all good. So that's, uh, it's clear that uh, the applicant is uh, listening and, and reacting um, appropriately to uh, input. So thank you for that. Um, I, I, the, the ginkgo below the tree that is being discussed here, it's great to hear that it's hardy. Um, and survivable. It's not a native species. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's a non-starter. It just means it's not a native species, and, and we always tend to prefer native species. Um, and uh, however, it has been uh, cultivated in here in Europe for hundreds of years, just as the applicant said. So uh, it may be an, uh, certainly an appropriate use here. One thing you might want to consider is mixing mixing it up with uh, perhaps perhaps the red, a red maple, something like that, an additional large shade tree, um, just to get some native species in there as well. But honestly, um, it, this is a, a great improvement. So thanks for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to address the board? Seeing none, I will go ahead and close public comment for this section of the hearing. Um, so with that, um, we'll turn back to Mr. Feldman. Are there other topics you had hoped to address yep, this evening? Just, just one final one. Um, yes, and uh, it's uh, to ask Mike Novak 
um, our civil engineer to um, follow up on um, where he was two weeks ago. He presented um, uh, a variety of um, uh, responses to the comments we've been getting from Mr. Reardon, which we have found to be um, very beneficial, and we and we appreciate the approach that both Cliff and and Sean have taken to help help us with this project. And uh, so, Mike, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for the. It's not going to be a long presentation, Mr. Chair, just to mm -hmm. fill you in on um, on what Mike has done, particularly with regard to now setting the building in its in its new location, uh, being further set back and being narrower. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you, Paul, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mike Novak, Patriot Engineering. I will uh, throw up the plans one second, uh, and I and I believe these are probably the plans that, uh, Mr. Chair, you were speaking about that haven't quite made it to the website. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, so I assume since they were uploaded, well, you have them. It's all right to share them. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Um, so again, as, as Mr. Feldman said, there's not a lot of changes. So if I can, um, I'll go through just quickly. Again, this is the existing conditions with the two existing houses. Um, I will just try to get to the, the plans that have had significant change to them. Uh, this is the layout plan. This does show the new building location, but I think it would be better served to show um, on the, the grading plan as well. And I'll, and I'll try to zoom in a little bit. So this is probably the, the best angle, um, full, Full view of the of the full building change again. This this plan does reflect the twenty foot is twenty point three. I think it was that Chris uh, mentioned, and the fifteen foot offset here. Again, you can see that the ten and the ten is held on this property line parallel to this property line. That way, that's why we do have the two different distances in the front. This corner being a little closer. Uh, the updated front layout is shown, and then the building reduction in width a foot on each side for a total width of 135. I did um, just for kind of scale and, and orientation, I did notch out where the, the upper courtyard would be and just tried to give that a little different uh, texture for lack of a better term, just to get a feel for how we were trying to line that up with the, the abutting property so it didn't feel too ominous. Um, <clears throat> I did go ahead and, ch and change the configuration of the infiltration system again, if you recall from the last presentation. I hadn't done that because we wanted to make sure that the board was on on par with us in terms of changes. So I've gone ahead and done that. The wall has not moved. So in regards to the riverfront impact and, and what we'll be bringing forth to conservation, the wall and everything beyond it has, has remained the same. Um, the system just got a little a little narrower, a uh, little narrower and a little longer and uh, still maintains the same drainage uh, results as we previously uh, proposed. <clears throat> I have tried to address some of the additional comments that were remaining. Uh, I did add a small um, concrete drywall here uh, right at the outlet just to help, you know, show a little more effort in terms of reducing or, or minimizing any any detrimental impact to the to the parking lot and any flow that may be happening just to capture a little extra bit as it's actually not um, in the model uh, and we're still reducing so Again, just almost a belt and suspenders type of thing. Um, that that's the that's the gist of it. Uh, some minor grading tweaks along the sides to make sure that we're not impounding water or sending water across properties. Um, really, just wanted to to nail that down so the intent is very clear that the water should stay on our property and move to the rear and, and not hinder any drainage um, on any other properties as well. Uh, I can quickly check the other oh i'm sorry there were, there were a couple of utility changes i don't know if how concerned the board is but i'm happy to share them um through conversations with mr reardon we took um i took the the domestic service off of the high pressure line and put it back to the low pressure line keeping the fire service on the high pressure line and um mr Reardon did ask for some some flow calcs uh, in regards to the sewer which i'm working on providing i've started here on the plan but um He's asked for some additional, which I will get him. Um, and 
Um, oh, this this plan is probably worth taking a look at too. This this is again the the flyer apparatus and, and the radius circles for the ladders, and you can see it probably covers. I don't have the other one to compare, but it covers a little bit more area now that the building's a little smaller, and uh, and push back a little bit as well. So I, th I think those are the major changes. Uh, probably best to just answer questions at this point. So, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, and I can leave this plan up if that makes sense. All right, Mike, thank you, Mike. If I may, Mr. Chair. Yeah, please, Matt. Mr. Chair. So I, I was not aware of that domestic water change. Um, oh, I, sorry. I, I, I do not believe that that low pressure line is going to be um, appropriate for um, the pressure we need in a five-story building, and we're going to be looking at boosting. And um, with all due respect, I'm, 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 I like to do, um, you know, one tap into a main, and you know, obviously branch off of that. You know, once we get to the private property with, you know, with the domestic, which is what we do on every project I think we've ever constructed. Um, in our career so i was you know um i want to i like to, to pause and revisit uh that conversation yeah. off, off you know offline and then we'll follow up at the next meeting if possible so that mr chair that's uh, to matt as well that's my fault i thought i did mention that so i don't mean to spring that on you uh, i think if uh, matt and sean and myself got together and made a plan i don't think that would be an issue to, to figure that out and make everyone happy okay no, not, a, not a problem um so uh, I, I think that the, the moves you've, you've made specifically in relation to the comments that were uh, provided last week by Tetra Tech, I think, make a lot of sense. Um, I think that the dry well at the, at the rear is a, you know, as you say, you know, sort of belt and suspenders, and it certainly works in that capacity um, to prevent uh, or at least greatly reduce any flow out into um, the adjacent property. And you know, anything we can do to reduce reduce sheet flow across that parking area going to, towards the brook, I think, is helpful. Um, there was a comment um, in the prior section about the uh, from Mr. Bomer about the um, the grades at the at the rear corner of the building, um, and I I think it was more a question about um, to how they might have been reflected in the architecturals, but. Uh, the, what is the elevation of the interior floor slab? The so first the, first floor. The garage floor slab is is ninety five two. Is ninety five two okay? Yeah, and we're we as you can see here, the grading is pretty much catching up to existing grade here, so it's yeah. there's not a lot of excavation. Matt, you can probably chime in as to how deep will be beyond that floor, um, past that elevate those existing elevations. I think you said is probably four or five feet if I'm. Tracking yeah, I mean, right? you would have a four foot frost wall, you have a, um, you know, mm -hmm. call it a, you know, two, I mean, no more than six feet to the bottom yeah. of, the, of your trench. Mm -hmm. And really, that's why the, the wall becomes a necessity, because we are so low and we are keeping the building up. So excavation in this rear area, and I think the, the plant, the, the tree concern is, is more in this area, mm -hmm. you know, and of course, we're 10 feet off and we're only going four to four to six feet. I think we'll, I think we'll be safe in terms of any root, root impact if there is any to be my opinion, very minimal. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chairman, we'll, we'll go and um, take some photographs of that area and um, we'll make it a point to to bring this back up next week and just make sure that um, oh, great. we're doing whatever we need to do um, for in, in, in terms of any root trimming or preservation of the. Okay. And, and Mr. Chair, sorry, yeah. one, uh, I'm just hoping to continue to answer Please. your question. As we move across, we're 94, we are at 95 at the at the um, entrances or e exit areas. And then we do slope off with 94, down 93, moving down to a 93, 92 area. So there is a slight drop off as you move to the, I believe that's the east, uh, west direction. Okay. Great. Um, and then you had said before the there is no change to that retaining wall at the rear um that's as it was before and it's just it's the orient it's the proportions of the infiltration system that have adjusted slightly to make it more rectangular correct it was it was more on a shape of, of sort of following the hand and basically i just pushed it out this way um, okay. keeping the same distance as i from the wall and, and trying to make up a more distance between the building and the system itself and there'll be a an impermeable membrane on this end to mitigate against um water pressure against the, the back of the wall okay. which is which has been there for a while it's just it's a small line just right. a small line of note it could be missed pretty easily okay um thank you for that are there 
questions from other members of the board? Not seeing any. Um, Mr. Reardon? Just one quick question, um, Chair. Uh, Mike, have you guys given any thought to the type of wall that's going to be? Because it really can't be modular block, right? Because you're not going to be able to have the the return fabric. So are you thinking just big concrete blocks or what are you thinking on that? Matt, you had, you had, we had talked about this. You had a preference for this, I believe, and I don't want to be wrong. So, or am I mistaken? Uh, my my understanding, um, Mike, was that we, we were going to be using a, a standard modular block uh, wall. Um, I, can you zoom into it? Because I've forgotten what we have for grade change there. Yeah. Um, yeah, Matt, you're not going to be able to use a standard modular no, block wall because you got to return all those fabric sections. And they can't go back into the infiltration system. So, yeah, and this guess, is this is probably the highest area through here, 94 to 84, roughly, in this pinch point. Um, it, yeah, based on that, obviously, geofabrics um, is is not going to work. So, yes, we, we would be back to a, um, a mass block um, wall system that would be self-supported with no geogrid based on a 10-foot grade change for sure. Yeah. And it looks like you've got room for that between the infiltration system and your face of wall, so you should be okay. Yeah. Agreed. And what would the facing of that be like on the north and east? Uh, so we'd have a split face, um, you know, a, um, a you know a stone uh, jagged face to it. Um, it is a you know a cast concrete, um, and they have a couple of different colors. It would typically a, a you know a darker gray um, color, and then obviously once you know we have our landscape program in, um, you know a lot of that would end up you know disappearing once that vegetation starts to to uh, thrive. Okay. Sean, did you have anything else? Nope, that's it. Great, thank you. Uh, Cliff, did you have anything? Of course I do. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, just a couple though. Uh, on, the, uh, on the layout of materials plan, there's a note about EV spaces, which is uh, good that that's gotten on the plan, but it conflicts with the sustainability letter because there are, are um, four EV spaces indicated on the civil plan and the and the uh, and the report that Chris issued said that there will be eleven. We're we're showing eleven on our architectural plan. There's okay. uh, three okay. in the lower left hand corner down down there, and then there's another four uh, in the upper right hand corner of the garage. We'll, we'll that conform. That's just uh, yeah. That's just a that's, that's a mess a, on my part. Yeah, that's not okay. Yeah, no, just, just a coordination issue. That, yeah, yeah, that's all. Mike, Mike hasn't caught up yet. Okay, yeah, I'm slow. Um, another question is the civil plans on sheet seven. Um, you are showing a gas line into the building, and I know that the sustainability letter. Uh, talks about heat pump for uh, space heating and cooling. And I'm wondering um, if you have considered going all electric in the building, including domestic cow water production. Uh, we, we have Cliff. The, the gas line is, uh, again, another one of those uh, Mike's plan hasn't caught up. We had a gas line shown for a rooftop generator in the event that okay. we didn't have the proper flows to support fire protection and we needed to have a pump system. With the high pressure line and, and the high degree of confidence we have all the flows that we need, we prefer to get rid of the generator and the gas line. So we're not yeah. intending to have a gas line at all. And, and again, Mike's plans just have to catch up. Terrific, okay. You read through kind of what I was hoping you'd say. Uh, the, the next question on sheet seven, is you're showing a number of street cuts out, in, out into Mass Ave. I just don't know what level of re restoration the, the city will require. And I'm bringing this up just so you're, you've got the right budget. 
you know, if it's been recently paved, they may want you to do a very long stretch or longer stretch versus trench cuts into the street. So I'm just bringing that up. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, I believe that was one of Sean's um, most recent comments, which I just need to, again, to use Paul's words, catch up on. But he talked about uh, kind of making this all one one bigger cut. And um, I'm not going to, I don't know, I can't remember it verbatim. So, but th it's a comment that I'll need to address with Sean. So thank you for bringing it up, Cliff. Okay. And last comment is only a kind of a bridge over to back to the sustainability letter, which is a note about domestic. Um, well, it says domestic hot water will be individually metered. So maybe that implies that I just didn't understand that when the where the domestic hot water would be individ, individually metered. Uh, I get that if that's an electric sort of on demand heat system, but you're not talking about um, having a, a water meter for each issue, are you or are no. you? No, the, the, the point is, is that the utility cost is going to be unit specific, and that prompts um, people to be more conscious of how they're using it because yeah. they're, they're directly paying for it. That it's, it's, we, we find that when you, when it's not a general expense, um, usage tends to be more prudent, and that's good for the environment. Yeah, okay. Uh, th that was all um, I came up with this uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the from the board, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon, this is the first time I've said anything actually since I'm here. Um, but I and I I will say that I'm disappointed that I didn't. Uh, see the sustainability letter uh, uh, before the hearing, uh, and I guess that has to do with everybody hurrying and and uh, sometimes that things are happening at the last minute. But I must say that from what I've heard about it uh, from Cliff and others, uh, I'm very pleased at uh, the fact that we have it, and I'm very pleased at the direction in which uh, all of this is going and. Uh, I'd like to commend the uh, the applicant for paying attention to these issues. Uh, they are very important, and they increasingly are going to be at the forefront of the way we evaluate buildings. And uh, and the applicant has done a pretty good job on this, from what I can tell. Now, of course, I'll read it like Chris, and then have a lot of things next time. But in general, it seems like a terrific uh, move in the right direction in planning these projects. And I'd like to commend the applicant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there other comments from the board? Seeing none. Um, Mr. Feldman, I believe this is the, this is the final section of uh, information you had wanted to present this evening. Is that correct? Right. So, Mike, you could stop sharing your screen. Um, yeah, but in I, terms of I, the, the applicant's presentation uh, okay. for what we plan to do tonight, uh, we're, we're, we're complete. Okay, thank you. Um, in that case, I did just want to briefly give the public an opportunity to comment just on this, on this last piece of the hearing. Um, again, if you would like to uh, address the board as it relates specifically to the changes to the civil plan as presented, um, you know, over the last half hour or so, um, you may uh, raise your hand using the raise hand feature on the participants tab or dial, excuse me, dial star nine if you're calling in. Um, so if there are any members of the public who wish to address this uh, section of the hearing, uh, please indicate your desire at this point. And I do not see anyone raising their hand, so I will go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, the, excuse me, the public comment period for this uh, section of the hearing. Um, right, so thank you for that. Um, so that sort of brings to an end the, the new information we had wanted to bring forward this evening. Um, as we mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the board had received over the last 24 hours um, 
the a set of revised plans uh, from the applicant as well as the project sustainability letter. Um, and we are in the process of getting those distributed and up on the, the website and posted to the agenda. So um, I would like to um, discuss those at the next hearing. Um, I So I but, just sort of taking a quick note of things that I, I think would be helpful to discuss. And I think it would be good for us to discuss at this st stage what information the board is still looking for from the applicant. Um, and then to discuss a little bit with uh, with Mr. Haverty, sort of what our next steps should be to make sure that we are, uh, you know, make uh, gathering all the information that we need and that we are, you know, approaching the end of the public hearing portion of the review of this comprehensive permit appropriately. Um, so what I had on my list was uh, to discuss the sustainability memo, to uh, go over those revised drawings. Um, I do want to touch on um, historically significant structures. Uh, one of these two buildings is listed as a um, on the town's historic inventory, um, and the board should discuss that. Um, I have been uh, in conversations with uh, inspectional services and the um, and the historic commission, in regards to these properties, there is there was a um, a demolition permit filed on this property, and we're trying to determine the status of that application uh, so that we completely understand exactly what the current situation is, so that. Um, should the board be looking to grant uh, the requested waiver in regards to demolition delay that the board is making an informed decision uh, based on what the current situation is of, of um, the, that demolition permit that had private, previously been filed. Um, and then I do want to uh, spend some time um, discussing the proposed waivers so that those uh, we have a chance to uh, make sure that the board understands what is being requested um, in the list of waivers. And the, the list of waivers were initially filed at the time of the, the application, and those are um, available on a, the town's website. Yeah, and I, I'm going to have one update, Mr. Chair, um, uh, a request on, on waiver on the INI um, mm -hmm. um, financial contribution. Um, I, I meant to update the waiver list uh, before tonight, but I'll make sure I get it done. Um, so it, it gets posted well in advance. I, I, okay. I just got to find the right uh, bylaw reference. Okay. So, and, and Mr. Chairman, are there any other changes to the waiver list that result from the changes to the design? So yeah. I know... I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, there's there's one. I mean, we were asking for a waiver on setbacks, uh, but we're no longer going to need that waiver because we're setback compliant. Yeah. So right. that's so, a, so that's a change going in the updated. other. That's a change going in the other direction. Paul. Right. So, so that should just be updated to reflect. That. Yeah, I'll I'll go through the um I'll go through the waiver list. I'll I'll delete what what we're now no longer needing a waiver for, and I'll I'll add the INI and double check with uh with Mike Novak and with Chris Mohern to make sure um we didn't miss anything else. Okay. Is that something that we could receive uh, within the week? Yes, yeah. I, I should be able to turn that around pretty easily. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, during the course of the evening, there have been a number of occasions in which uh, uh, Mr. Feldman or others have said, well, we could deal with that with the condition. Um, and I at least can't at this moment re construct all of the places where that happened. Uh, but as, as we're getting really close to the end, it would be helpful, I think, to the board if the applicant could review what they've said and, and what we've talked about here. And where there has been a suggestion for a condition, if the applicant could provide a proposed language that we could work with, either maybe the next time or the time after. But it would be helpful to have that begin to get nailed down as we get into the process of considering what goes into uh, the comprehensive permit itself. And it seems to me that we're getting close enough that we should be thinking about uh, making that transition. Absolutely. 
And, and Mr. Chairman, to piggyback on that, I think it would also be helpful to have Sean and Cliff provide any um, recommended uh, conditions that they think should be added as well. And Paul, I usually put mine in my letters in, in closing yep. out comments, so you can just go back in the record. But I'll, at the closing stages, I'll, I'll sort of consolidate all my thoughts and suggest ones. That would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if, yep. if I could just take one step further, um, I'm very sensitive to the fact that once we go into the deliberation stage, we can't get any new information. Um, and it would be very helpful, actually, if the applicant and, uh, and the, the town's experts could work together to make sure that by the time we finish, we know where there's an agreement and where there's a disagreement on, on conditions. Uh, I, I, I would like to make sure that anything that Sean produces, Paul has, has had a chance to review and tell us whether he thinks that's fine or whether he thinks it would be fine if something else happened or whether he thinks it's an abomination. And uh, uh, just, just so we know, because again, I'm very sensitive to how we get into the actual deliberation process and everybody looks at everybody else and tries to remember what it was that that we said about that and uh, it takes a lot of time and it's a frustrating process. So anything mm -hmm. we can do to, to get this all clear before we before the bell rings and we have to go into the deliberation would be helpful. Absolutely. Um, and partly to that end too, I did, um, I met this morning with, um, uh, with Colleen Ralston, who's our, our new uh, ZBA assistant, um, and she's been working with um, a company to get the the meetings uh, transcriptions taken care of. That was something that we had uh, requested be funded at the end of the previous hearing. And so that is underway. Um, and so uh, I don't know the timeline on that at this point, but we, we will uh, get those distributed as soon as they are available. And in the meantime, I've got 12 pages of notes from tonight. So whenever... <laughs> Whenever somebody <laughs> mentioned the the word condition, I've got a note on that. You know, uh, so uh, Chris, if I if I can ask, I'm I'm happy to propose condition language. I do it all the time. I'm happy to uh, coordinate with um, uh, Sean and Cliff so that to the extent we can uh, agree upon uh, condition language, and the board knows that it's it's as Mr. Hanlon said is. It's an accepted condition. Uh, we're happy to do that. Um, and if you can take a few minutes, I, I know this is it's a burden on, on, on your part, but if you could take a, uh, a few minutes where you've identified a reference to condition where you're expecting to see one, and even if it's just a bullet list on an, on an email, yep. um, if you get us that bullet list, we can we'll know what we'll know what you're getting at and we could we could propose a condition uh, so so that way we 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 sort of advance uh, mr hanlon's suggestions so that we're as complete mm -hmm. uh, as as possible okay. uh, the other thing that that i think we'll benefit from is because we hope to be at the concom on march 16th um uh, we'll begin to hear, um, you know, specific um, uh, order of condition type conditions, which we'll get under the State Wetlands Protection Act, but will conform. I'm sure the board's going to want to conform its local order of conditions so that we have a common set. Right. Mr. Chair, can I ask a quick question? Yes, sir. Um, do you by chance have a past decision, comprehensive permit decision that I could look at just as a sort of a roadmap to where you've been and where you like to go? Absolutely. Um, so if you go to the, the ZBA's website, mm -hmm. um, the comprehensive permit decision, I believe the decisions for Thorndike Place and 1165 RMS Ave are both posted there. If okay, not, great. I can get those. I'll, I'll check as well. And if they're not there, I'll, I'll just forward them to you. Okay, thanks. Great, that's good. The Thorndike Place one is insanely thorough, so the 1165R one is a little more manageable. 
So is, is the more manageable one the, the direction you're planning on taking? <laughs> we'll have to see. That sounds good. <laughs> um, are there other things we should be keeping in mind heading into this next hearing? I think you've covered everything that I can think of, Paul. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, the only other thing that we'll ask um, both Mike um, Novak, Chris Mulhern, and Kyle Zeke, they'll, we'll, we're going to ask them to make sure they spend a few minutes um, making sure that all their plans conform. Uh, you know, they these things sequence, and yeah. we've tried to keep this process moving. It's been very important to the applicant. We appreciate how well the board has moved with us since we've gotten going. Uh, because it's a very expensive process. So um, over the next couple of weeks, um, we'll ask Chris, Mike, and, and Kyle to really scrub their drawings to make sure we have a conforming set so that we don't have issues like Cliff brought up about one, one set of drawings mm -hmm. potentially being inconsistent with another set. Okay. No, that's definitely appreciated. Um, Is there anything else um, to discuss on this this evening? If not, um, the next scheduled hearing uh, for uh, this uh, comprehensive permit would be Thursday, March 9th, uh, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Um, I would just note for the the board and the public that the you know the comprehensive permits hearing the public hearings have to conclude within 180 days of their being initiated. Uh, that 180 day is April 16th, so we've got a little bit of time left, um, but we are definitely getting to the end of that period. Um, but at this stage, um, barring any you know major changes, I don't see the need that that we would need to extend that period by any stretch. Um, and then once the public hearing has been closed, the board has 40 days to uh, issue its final decision, its final written decision. Um, and those meetings, because the board is no longer allowed to take public testimony, those meetings are public meetings because it is a meeting of the board, but we uh, do, cannot accept any input by anyone other than the board um, and Mr. Haverty, who is helping us to, to draft the decision. So that's the procedure for us going forward. Um, so with that, I would ask, I will move that the- Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I just noticed that Ms. Chapnick has her hands up and oh. uh, you may want to catch that. I just thank have a procedural, yeah, yes, thank please. you for recognizing me. I just have a procedural question. Um, you had said, when does this need to close by? So the board can only take public testimony while the public hearing is open, and yeah. the public hearing has to close by April 16th. Okay, I maintain that might be a problem. Okay. Because we are not hearing, we are not opening the notice of intent under the Wetlands Protection Act until March 16th. Okay. And our next meeting after March 16th is April 13th. Ah, okay. And we almost never close in one meeting. I mean, usually sure. we have to ask, you know, just like you do, you know, we ask for <laughs> more information or whatever. Um, and even if we close on the 13th, that might be tight, but we might. I mean, it yep. might just take two meetings. I can't say, but I'm concerned that you again, that the ZBA does not close their meeting before the Conservation Commission does. Right. So that we have consistent conditions. Okay. Okay. So the, so the board will be meet the board. So we, at this meeting, we would be continuing to the 9th of March. You would be meeting on the 16th of March. The board at the on the 9th of March would be continuing to the 23rd of March. At that point, we should have a better sense about how the initial NOI hearing went. Um, and then uh, if the applicant would be amenable, we I would like to then discuss at that hearing um, 
whether we should extend the public hearing period um, sufficiently so that we can close um, at the time of the conclusion of the end of the NOI hearings. Yeah, well, we'll I, I think your suggestion uh, is a good one. Let's let's see how the process takes shape. Um, okay. the, the, you know, for I, we hope because we have spent some time um, talking to the Conservation Commission in a pre-application, non-binding, um, informational um, context that um, the Conservation Commission is is not starting from scratch informationally. They they sort of understand uh, the the project. Uh, what we presented to them is not a wholesale. It's not going to be a wholesale change from what we presented to them in a pre-application hearing. So I'm going to root for um, two public meetings with the CONCOM. I'm going to root for that and, and, and have confidence that we're going to be able to get it done, particularly if we have, you know, that month apart where we can supplement with whatever uh, feedback we're going to get um, from the CONCOM on the 16th. So it, 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 I think it's just premature to figure out what kind of extension, if any, we're going to need. Um, mm -hmm. we, if there is an extension needed, we really are going to ask that it be kept to a minimum. I think I've mentioned before, Absolutely. under our purchase and sale agreements, we're paying monthly extension fees for permitting. And it, it, it's it's a, um, I'm not going to say it's a money pit, but it's it's challenging. No, certainly understood. And I, I think the, the anticipation is that it would not be um, an extended a continuation. It would really just be to the point that we can, um, you know, understand what the conclusion of the NOI process is before the the board closes the public hearing. And, and we appreciate the CONCOM willing to consider our NOI uh, prior to the completion of the comprehensive permit, precisely for the coordination. So we're 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 doing this purposefully, so let's make sure we accomplish the goal. Absolutely. Great, thank you. And, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chapman, appreciate that. And with that, um, I think we are prepared. So I will move to continue the public hearing for the residences at Millbrook until Thursday, March 9th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Um, we have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. So this is a roll call vote of the board to continue with this public hearing on the residences at Millbrook until Thursday, March 9th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Um, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Uh, Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Nope, oh, I, see, I see you mouthing high, there we go. Uh, and the chair votes aye. So we are continued on the public hearing for the residences at Millbrook until Thursday, March 9th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. Excellent. Um, thank you. Thank you all very much for that. Um, just that the board, can, before we close the, the, the full meeting, um, just for the board. Um, so we, we are meeting next Tuesday, the 28th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, we have four hearings on the docket. Um, one of them is a continuance, which is 189 Forest Street. One of them was a, uh, a delayed um, application, which was originally scheduled to be heard on the 14th. Uh, but in order to receive proper completed application, that has been moved to the 28th. So that will be heard as well. Um, and then there are two additionals that are on the docket for the, the 28th. Uh, one is 212 Pleasant Street, and the other one is 20... I think it's Hobbs, I think is the name of the street um, in the, the industrial district off of Mass Ave. Um, so those will be going forward. Um, I actually have a conflict on the 28th at the start of the meeting. So I will be unable to um, attend the start of the meeting. Uh, Pat will be taking over at the start. Um, also, I have a conflict with 212 Pleasant Street. Um, and that I was, I assisted the, the realtor um at the time of the, the purchase and sale with uh some questions regarding um regarding the property and what some of the town bylaws are and so uh i don't think it's appropriate that i hear that case so i've 
um, ask uh, Pat to go ahead and that that might be a good case to start with. And then I can, I'll join the meeting as, as possible. And then uh, the board can conclude 212 uh, Pleasant Street and then I can join in afterwards. So um, that's our hearing for the 28th. And then, as we said before, we have a comprehensive permit on the on March 9th, and we will likely also have it on March 23rd as well. Um, so that is our upcoming schedule. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I would especially like to thank uh, Colleen Ralston and Vincent Leaf for all their assistance in uh, preparing for this online meeting. I have, please note the purpose of the board's recording this meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of its proceedings. It is our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. And if anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank Second. You, Thanks, Mr. DuPont. So roll call vote of the board to adjourn tonight's hearing. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, Thank everyone. you. Good night. Everybody.